This is this Women is in Linux. Women in Linux. Welcome to the Women in Linux podcast, exposing women to information and careers in technology. Thanks for joining Women in Linux with your host, Tamika Reed and Dee Parler. Today, we have Amy Rich, who's the Director of Engineering at NUNA. Hey, Amy, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, my gosh. Um, Tamika has talked about you so much, um, and I'm. this is the first time I get to chat with you. So can you tell um, our listeners a, a little bit about who you are? Sure. Uh, so I am the engineering director at Nuna Incorporated, which is a, a startup in the San Francisco Bay Area. We do data warehousing for healthcare applications. We have both a commercial and a government side. On the government side, we are well known for working with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid on a bunch of their back-end data stuff. So we provide analytics to the government so they can tell what programs are working well in states and, and which ones aren't and where they can make improvements. And on the commercial side, we work with payers and insurance. And the, the ultimate goal of our company is to push value-based healthcare. Uh, so we're trying to make healthcare both cheaper and more effective for people in the United States. Oh, goodness, that's definitely needed. That's the first time I've heard it uh, phrased as value-based healthcare. Tam, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. So I, I did have a question because actually we just did a meetup on this. And the meetup was in terms of AI ops and data ops. And O'Reilly came out with a newsletter about hiring data engineers versus data analysts. And so being that you're in this space, it was a great opportunity kind of to do a follow up on that. Do you consider data ops a term? And if if it's not a term, what about data engineering? Uh, so data operations is actually a department that reports to me. I have data quality, data operations, IT infrastructure, and security. Uh, there's also a, we call them data platform. Other people will call them data engineers. And we have data science as well. So, uh, and we have product engineers. So between all of those departments, that is what makes up the bulk of our engineering and data science department. Awesome. So one of the big things that I saw from, you know, my research on data ops and data engineering was the skill sets. So can you talk about your skill sets and on becoming an engineering manager and then maybe even adding in like some of the skill sets that you see data engineers would need or someone who wants to make that transition to that? So it's a twofold question, but you can talk about your skill sets first. So first talking about me, um, I graduated with a computer science degree back in 1995, uh, but my real love was not programming at all or engineering even, and it was system administration. And so I was a system administrator for, uh, we'll, we'll call it roughly 20, 25 years. And uh, I was working at Mozilla Corporation, the folks who make Firefox. and the the manager that we had was a brand new manager and he was incredibly smart and an incredibly good engineer um but he really did not get the people management thing and he took a month and he went to singapore and i was left as the team lead and i sort of naturally gravitated toward leading the team and when he came back he was still more interested in working on the engineering and so his manager uh about 6 months later said you know what, we're, we're going to make you the manager of the team and you're going to take this over and run things from here on out. And that was about seven years ago. Uh, so since then, I've gone from managing uh, what was called engineering operations, um, release engineering operations specifically. Uh, and then I became a senior manager and I became the head of operations at Mozilla for the, the team that I was on. And then I switched over to Nuna and I became a director of engineering. And now there are a multitude of departments that report to me, some of which I have background in, like uh, security and infrastructure are much more my belly whip than data operations or data quality. And obviously I have some background in IT as well. To answer the second part of your question, so the, the data operations folks tend to focus mostly on ETL, 
they need to know a lot of SQL. There's a, there's a lot of query building that they do. They're the ones that functionally deal with data input and data output. The data engineers are actually uh, sort of our backend product folks, and they are mostly Python people, and they're building the, the tools that uh, we run big Spark clusters, for example. We use EMR. Um, so they're the folks that are writing all the tooling that does the data ingestion pipeline. So the, the two of them work closely together but have very distinctly different roles. And that's interesting you say that because I, I actually pulled up the uh, the mind map of, of this that I had found for data ops. One of the, on that mind map was the developers and architects and then the data engineers and then security and governance. And from listening to uh, what you were talking about with EMR, so I hear cloud, <laughs> And also you say you give uh, reports off to the government. So I'm assuming some, I don't know, if I'm, I'm making assumptions here. I don't know if the government data is classified or not, but I'm assuming there's some type of rules that you have to meet with that in terms of how you get the data and then what and how you can use the data and then whatever compliance rules you may meet, need to meet from there. And then the data scientists and operations for me, the, looking at data ops is, is well, I don't want to say well beyond because that, that that would be being lying, but it's a little bit more advanced than what DevOps is, but it still encompasses a lot of uh, DevOps rules, but it sounds very broad in terms of skill sets. And so to me, DevOps is more of a philosophy and how your developers work with your operations people. It's not a particular role. Correct. So both like the infrastructure team and the data operations team both wind up using DevOps principles. Uh, like we talk about the, the cycle time that we have and working with engineering closely and making sure to communicate with the customer. Um, but they, they do have very different roles. And I wouldn't say that one is like, I wouldn't say that data operations is more advanced than say infrastructure engineering which again is one of the other teams that reports to me. Typically the the skill sets are different and narrower for our data operations people than they are for our, our infrastructure engineers or our data engineers. Okay. Especially the infrastructure engineers because they're expected to do more engineering and operations where the data operations people are more strictly operations and SQL. And then to me, I then I look at it as like if you're, like the old school person, you probably do it all anyway. So it's kind of like the same to you. Yeah. And I, that's really no longer possible, right? There's, there's just too much to specialize in to be able to hold any entire stack in your head anymore. Yep. Um, and to get back to what you were saying about uh, governance, we have an entirely separate GRC and privacy department. And because we deal with healthcare data, we're bound by HIPAA regulations. Right. Um, there's, there's also, other various certifications that we go through, like SOC 2 and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's another arm of the company that helps facilitate a bunch of that work as well. All right. And I know we're kind of steering off some, some things, but this kind of covers a lot of things that I talked about the other night. Um, with the governance of data, uh, what I have seen, and I don't know if this still holds true in inside your your company, um, a lot of people who who do security are now having to pick up some tech skills in order to meet the role of compliance to help teams out to meet those compliance roles in terms of like, hey, we understand that you need to meet these goals on paper, but how do I implement that? Or how do you help me get there to implement those things? Have you seen that in your organization? Definitely. So we, we have this sort of concept of guilds, which is people gather around a particular discipline or a set of disciplines. And they're often people that need to work closely together, but have different skill sets. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a, a bi-weekly meeting every Friday that is governance, risk, compliance, and privacy, which is one department, security, legal, and I represent... Um, a variety of departments. So security reports to me, GRC does not. We have explicitly taken that out of engineering. So that reports up through the legal arm. So there's a sort of check and balance 
the GRC and privacy folks help us interpret what the the basic regulations are and what sort of controls we should have in place. And then the, the security folks and the engineers help implement those controls and enforce them. That's super huge. Like the, the key word that I took out of that is interpret the regulations. Oh, yeah. It- <laughs> it's very complex, especially on the government side. Um, I attempted to read through all of the regulations that that govern um basically what it takes to put a product into production underneath the CMS, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Systems. And it's it's like a heavy stack of paper if you print it out. And so you definitely need someone who is conversant in just the regulations to tell you what they mean and how they apply to what you're trying to do. Black hole. <laughs> It's very complicated. <laughs> very, 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 very. It's the government. I think well, I mean, if you look up the government. I don't co- want to say it's just the government. I'm just, I, well, here's how my take on it. I think more interpretation and skill sets are needed to meet these goals. And then also you can't, there some of the regulations, and, and this may be a people thing, some people who are in position only understand the regulations and not actually the technical side on how to apply it. So there's a, there's a large gap in understanding how to get it done and what it, and the effort that it takes. And the fact that it takes, you know, in some institutions, five years to implement something, or we don't have funding for it, or we want to implement this, but we can't because this application is 10 years old, but we need to meet this current this current uh, uh, rules and standards, but we can't. Oh, and by the way, it got hacked. So, <laughs> you know, well, yeah. Like- and the re- the rules and standards are based on dated software and and, and hardware. So it, it's it's a plethora of things <laughs> of things, especially when the government is trying to move into more digital when they're just not equipped for it. Yeah, the government has been making a really interesting transition from, you know, to sort of on-prem data centers to the cloud, which was specifically GovCloud. And there were things that could only live in GovCloud, which had segregated machines. And there were all sorts of, um, you know, firewalling design and VPNs and things that you needed to get into that. And then they started to open things up to sort of general commercial AWS, but your applications have to be fed ramped which means that they go through this process of approval by the federal government and you can only use certain tools. Um, mm-hmm. And so they're, they're getting more and more open, but you find that some of the contractors that you deal with inside the government who are providing support services for, say, AWS, they don't really understand what AWS architecture is supposed to look like. So mm-hmm. their mental mm-hmm. model of that is still a bunch of servers in a data center. And, like, you need to have... Um, packet filters on every machine you need to have physical firewalls you need to have like, that's that's not really how it works in the cloud and you're not taking advantage of the aspects of the cloud that are supposed to make your job easier to deploy and manage all of this infrastructure yep the vlans and here and this yep. vpc you can't talk to that vpc or you you gotta get you gotta make four hops before you get there and it's like uh okay Sure. You're listening to Women in Linux. Now, I know we, we talked about some uh, engineering skill sets and then some of the data engineering or, and data ops skill sets, but on your, on your journey and as an engineering manager, how do you mentor others? Like say someone that wants to come out of security and maybe make a transition over to uh, doing more uh, data warehousing or something. And then how do you mentor someone or mentor other people who want to move into those positions and maybe even into a leadership position such as yourself? So at the director level, the majority of people that I wind up mentoring are more junior managers who are either line managers or senior managers. Mm -hmm. I will also occasionally take a technical person who is a really high performer and is interested in leadership, not necessarily management, but leadership and how to be a better technical leader. 
and I sort of sponsor them and help mentor them as well. So I think I have five managers that I mentor inside the company right now and four technical leads. So mm-hmm. often the the kind of things that we discuss are, you know, how to influence people, how to make decisions, how to talk about, understand and reduce risk. Um, so I don't, I don't get my fingers into the pie of this is how you deploy uh, a stack in Amazon with Terraform anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I leave that up to my tech leads. And what I'm teaching my tech leads is this is how you work across departments to get your goals met. This is how you get buy-in on the stuff that you want to do. And you should be telling me as the tech lead, the technical direction that we are going to take as a company. Right. And is this group mentoring? No, these are all, well, so I do individual mentoring and because my current company has a very young management layer Mm -hmm. um, and even previously at Mozilla, one of the things that I did was I started uh, a a group mentoring thing, which we called manager workshops. Um, Because if you, like if you go out there and you look for technical mentorship, there are all sorts of resources, right? There are, there are people who are willing to tell you things, there are articles, there are books, And to some degree, there are those things for managers too, but there's a lot of stuff that you can't just talk about openly on the internet because they're either HR related or they're company specific Mm -hmm. or you have internal knowledge that you're not allowed to share. And so I feel that it's really important for the managers themselves to be able to come together as a team to talk about the kind of issues that impact the company as a whole, their department, their teams in sort of a a safe space where they can have these kind of conversations. Right. And so one of the the key words out of everything I heard you say was sponsorship. And that's totally different than what it is uh, for when you're talking about mentorship. Correct. So at a a conference that I did a, a panel on, one of the questions was, how do you get women into leadership without them having to go into like project management where they lose their tech skills. And I find oftentimes that's, that's a a very delicate balance. And I don't know, like from your perspective, like you said, you, you get your tech leads to give you guidance. So basically training up leaders, but what, what are you actually looking for in your tech leads when they're talking about the technical stack or the direction they should go. And then how do you, how do you keep your tech skills up so you can know that that is the right decision? So I have a different philosophy about management. Um, One of the things that I was doing when I joined Nuna is we were redesigning our career ladders and we have two parallel tracks. We have one that is management and one that is technical and they both go up to what is equivalent of the VP level. Um, so on the technical side, that would be fellow on the management side, that would be VP. And on the technical side, um, below that is distinguished engineer. And then there's a staff, uh, sorry, principal then staff. And the way I look at people management is the thing that I need to understand about the technical stuff is I need to have at least enough of a background so that I can understand more or less, like, is somebody pulling the wool over my eyes? Um, Should this be taking half as long as it's actually taking? Uh, Is this not feasible at all? And sometimes I am a rubber duck for technical people. They will sit there and they will talk to me about things. And I have a lot of experience with sort of systems architecture. And I can talk about systems architecture and like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And when it comes to the operations piece, like, do you have a launch checklist? And often it's some really simple things that that people miss completely. It's like, oh, we forgot about monitoring. It's like, well, okay, you you can't go into production until you have monitoring and metrics and a way to actually know if the service is down or underperforming. It's like, but we designed this great thing. I'm like, that's that's wonderful. What happens when the rubber meets the road? (laughs) But, (laughs) the big but, like... uh, (laughs) Uh, and, and I'm on a project just like that right now. And when I tell you, I'm like, they're like, Hey, we're going to, we, we're going to do monitoring. I said, well, what type of monitoring are you going to do? How granular do you want to get? 
what's going on. They were like, what do you mean? And I'm like, what do you mean what I mean? Like, we supposed to know this. We're designing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're designing this. We need to know these things. What type of metrics are we getting? What type of metrics do you want to receive? Application metrics, you know, metrics from your server, you know, network metrics. Like, there's all kind of metrics. We do, we get, we get metrics every single day in our email. You have five new emails. <laughs> <laughs> so when it, when it comes to my role, what what I tell people is my job is not to make these decisions. My job is to make you think about what the right decisions are and how you know they're the right decisions and how often you check and revisit that. So the questions I will ask you are not, you know, did you think to add monitoring the system? It's, well, what happens if the system goes down? How do you know? What's important to look at? And it's sort of those general concept questions that, again, I have very, very smart people who are ICs. Sometimes they just need that little prompting to think of what if, what if this happens? Did you consider what about? And that is really the joy I take in my job and helping people learn and grow how to think of these things for themselves, because this is how they level up. This is how they go from, you know, really junior people who are thinking like, what's my next task for the week up to, we have a really complex system. Why is it complex? How do I make it simpler so that it's easier to use? So it's faster so we can change it more safely um, and, and growing people along that axis. And now that I'm a director, I don't really have a lot of ICs that report to me. It's mostly managers. But I use the same sort of method with them when I talk about them and trying to get them to let go of some of the technical aspects and trust their tech leads and the, the people so that it's the tech people who are focusing on the technology who are making those decisions. And the people managers are more focused on team health, professional growth, um, you know, things along that line, being able to translate company strategy into these are the hard, important questions that we need to solve. And then being able to talk to their tech leads and go, how are we going to solve that? And the manager is not the one saying how the manager is the one saying what. And, you know, I often struggle, um, you know, women in Linux, there's a leadership position. And then my job daily is project management. And that line of thought, that train of thought is so hard to go from like implementation to a leader mentality, especially when you're doing two different things in a day, in, in, in one day. So, I mean, that's so great that you give them those opportunities to just from a different perspective wise, because I struggle with that. Like, OK, how do I for women in Linux see, as Tamika says, the three, uh, what do you call it? A 90 foot view <laughs> and going down and not wanting to do all this stuff myself. Yeah, I do the 30,000 foot view and then. Uh, take it and then take it and break it apart, break the, the, the task apart and break it into pieces and then divvy those pieces up to those that are, you know, team leads that are capable of doing that or they don't know, but it gives them a chance to figure things out and spark a thought process and then, um, have them partner with someone that can help them along the way to get to where 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 they can help each other get to where they need to go um, is more how I think. And in that approach, that's just how I approach uh, women in Linux and things that we do as, as far as teaching. So s similar, a little similar. We just don't have, you know, an entire team like you do, but similar approach. And I think that, that one of the, the biggest mistakes that people who are just going into management make is they try very much to hold on to the things that they did as a technical contributor because that's what they know how to do. And that's where they feel that immediate satisfaction of, I wrote this thing, I deployed this thing, like I made this change and bam, there was the effect of my work. But when you go into people management and, and I, 
I want to be clear. Leadership and people management are, are two distinct things. Anybody can be a leader. People management is a different job and it requires different skills. So when people ask me, you know, like, what, what do you do to keep your technical skills sharp? Well, I mean, I do have my own Linux and Solaris boss cause at, at home and I play around with those, but that's not what bleeds over into my work life. As a director that far up the chain, what I'm thinking about is strategy, it's organizational design, it's, you know, developer throughput. Um, they're much larger organizational questions. They're not, I'm dipping my fingers into the technology because that is a job that I have left and I have made room for somebody else to step into that role. And now I am thinking about a different scope and a different angle and it is very much, you know, the 30,000 foot view. I can't see the people down there. What I see are the clouds. I see the buildings. I know there are people down there and I'm trusting that they're doing the right thing. You're listening to Women in Linux. And, and with that being said, having that trust. So for you, is this like the, the, the pinnacle of your career for yourself? And if it's not, where do you see yourself going to next? And then how do you uh, lend a helping hand to, say, if you did move, to leave the door open for someone else? How do you make that transition? Because the thought process is you should be training up leaders and you should be rolling yourself out of a position is what the thought process is, depending on if you want to go somewhere else or not. But how do you make that transition, if any? Whenever I talk to people about professional development, a lot of them get hung up on what do I want to be when I grow up, right? And it doesn't matter what age they are. Um, and they struggle with trying to picture five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out. So the advice I tend to give to them is what's the thing you want to learn in the next year? Where do you want to be one year from now or two years from now if you don't have this master plan of how things are going to work? And I actually apply that to myself as well, because I don't know what's going to change in the next five years. I don't know what the landscape is going to look like. I don't know what companies there will be. I don't know what technologies will be prevalent. I'm pretty sure there's still going to be a need for management somewhere. Um, but for me personally, I try to focus on where I am right now and learning and doing a good job at what I'm doing. So I, I like being a director right now. It gives me the opportunity to work across the entire company and have really broad impact. If I look down the road, maybe there's a VP of something in my future. It's probably not VP of all of engineering because I don't have as much interest in some areas of engineering as I do in others. It probably isn't CTO because I don't want to drive the technical direction of the entire company. Uh, one of the things I have thought about is COO. Like I'm very interested in sort of organizational capabilities and the the people aspects of things. So maybe that is a future career for me. But right now I'm more focused on picking up the skills that I think are going to be useful to a broad range of opportunities. And I visit those opportunities when they come up. And sometimes I will be dissatisfied and I will go out and I will specifically look for something new. Like, I believe people tend to go through these cycles of, I, I don't know anything about topic X. I want to learn, I want to learn, I want to learn. And then they learn a lot about that. And they're like, I feel like I've mastered that. I want to be a leader in that area. And then they go out into, you know, it's that, it's that big fish, small pond, small fish, big pond. Right. Um, and so here, like, I felt I learned a lot at Mozilla and there was a lot of things I wanted to do and a lot of change I wanted to affect. And so I'm getting the opportunity to do that in my current role. And when it comes to, you know, making sure that you hold the door open for others and you make space for other people, like I've, I've pretty much continually done that as I've both moved up technically and moved up on the management track. Um, one of the things they teach you, well, I say they teach you, one of the things I have learned as a manager, no one honestly really ever teaches you, is that you always want to be succession planning. You should always be thinking, if I leave, who's going to take my place? What are they going to need to know? What skills are they going to have to have? What are they going to do? 
and looking for individuals within your organization or even sometimes without who are going to be a good fit for that, that you can coach, that you can sponsor, that you can give opportunities to, to help raise them up to that level so that by the time you're ready for the next thing, there's somebody else waiting in the wings who can step in to take either all or part of your job. I can listen to you forever, Amy. <laughs> I've, been, I've been listening to a lot of audio books lately and I'm just thinking to myself, I can listen to a book on leadership, like a whole series of you forever. Like you definitely, I know your time is limited, but definitely come back and speak to our group in regards to leadership because it's so clear. It is so, <laughs> it's so clear and concise. It, it's amazing. Uh, but, amusingly, one of the the Slack workspaces I'm on, which is women in tech, we were we were there's a whole bunch of leadership conversations that are taking place there, and there was a specific channel about management. And uh, somebody posed a question. I posted this long answer, and they were like, "You should write a book." <laughs> I was having, thinking the same thing. <laughs> having worked on books, I know that is a labor of love, and there's there's not a lot of money in that. So. <laughs> You really have to want to put that book out. But it was very flattering. And thank you for your kind words. Those are also very flattering. Oh, well, you know what? In, now that we're driven by so much content, you don't even have to write a book. You can just do like a couple of like video snippets and we just ask you a question and you can just upload it to YouTube. And that's like your <laughs> thought of the day, like riveting management chat of the day it was I mean I'm just like oh we're on a podcast she's we're not listening to her on the podium <laughs> so amusingly <laughs> enough back back when I was a technical contributor I used to write for sysadmin magazine and I would do their Q&A column and it was pretty much that people would ask questions and I would go out and sometimes do research or answer questions and um it was a lot of fun uh I also wrote for Sun Microsystems, who of course is now mostly defunct. They've been rolled into Oracle, um, but on, on topics about Solaris administration too. So yeah, those sort of shorter chunks of things are, are much more entertaining and much more sustainable and fun to do. Oh goodness. Well, hey, we are, we have room on the board. <laughs> but you know, that, that actually brings up a good point. Would be a good series is like a 15, well, maybe a 30 minute live stream on, you know, hey, I want to move into leadership and just do a live stream on, you know, random questions like post, you know, post your questions or whatever. Come get come get and maybe have a, like a panel on it and not necessarily like you have to give like your history and your background, but just responding to questions like this will be my approach. What do you think? Do you think this would be like a like a, a, a AMA is what they say. Ask me anything. That's what it is. You're listening to Women in Linux. What books do you recommend or podcasts do you recommend that, um, I guess, training up leaders or anything data related people should listen to or read? So I actually have a portion of my own Google Drive site that has one of the things it has in it is a, a Google Doc that has a link to training materials and videos and books and web resources about leadership stuff. Uh, if you'd like, I can send you the link to that and you can add that to the podcast. Please. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes, we would like that. Um, and also, what roles would you like to see more women in? Oh, definitely leadership. I have worked with very few women who are CEOs. Let me clarify that. Uh, Non-binary, transgender <laughs> women, like... I I love working with men. I have spent most of my life around men, working with men, but I also want to see other thoughts and other opinions and other experiences, you know, people of different genders and race and color and body size and like all the things. We need more diversity at the top to help inform the stuff that we're building, because what we have right now is a very narrow segment of the population who is deciding the majority of what gets built for everyone. 
and often it's not a good fit. And we could be so much more productive and make so many more better things if we had that diversity. I do. One of my themes, like uh, it, and it, I don't say it took me a while to like clearly plant my foot in it, but one of the my my ongoing theme is to train up leaders um, and get people to start not focusing on just the skill sets that they need, but how do they think about the in a, the what they're doing from a a total enterprise view, like how does this affect the next team. How do how do how to think big and then break it back down and then grow and add a skill set, you know, and keep moving up in skill set and moving up in in your career and in position. And then so for some people, they just don't want to do that. But um, I've been trying to get people to focus on the the big picture of 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 things and then how do you achieve that and where you can see yourself maneuvering to because a lot of times people come into the industry and again they're they've been told that I need to just code and then they get into coding and then they don't even realize that you know you have this whole cloud solution out there uh, uh infrastructure ops um automation uh, observability uh, tracing, metrics, logging, like that's a whole new thing, not to mention Kubernetes and Nomad or something of that nature. And I was like, well, didn't nobody tell me about this? Where it's like, mm, you know, big picture, getting with the right people and thinking about it, but it's just, some of the stuff is just not, not intuitive. I get, I get it, but I try to be the, inf- now I want to say informant because then that's going to be CIA and NSA. <laughs> But I mean, I try to be informative of information, you know, push that out to everybody as much as I can. And for me, one of the the reasons that it's so critical not to just have women on the ground in IC roles, but in, in management and other leadership roles is that we need to help change the culture. Right. The the culture right now is not great for the entire world. Regardless of, you know, if you're a man or a woman, if we're if we're splitting this down the gender line or if you're non but certainly not if you're non-binary uh, or transgender. And we have the opportunity as leaders and as managers and especially people high up in companies to have so much more impact. Not that the the people who are on the ground as ICs don't have impact, but when I was an IC, when I was a sysadmin, you know, I could impact, say, 100 servers, right? As if I was in the same company and I was in a position of, you know, upper management, not only do I get to impact what you do on those 100 servers, I get to impact what the entire directorate does or the entire division does. And so it's so much more and so much more opportunity for making positive change. I like that. So we come to the end of our podcast. We've always leave the door open for you to say whatever it is you want to say. We call it the shameless plug. Drum roll. Yeah, you can shout out your your dog, your cat, your cat, <laughs> your crew, squad, your, crew, your, your, your <laughs> birds, you know, your, your children, your high five, whoever. This is this is the opportunity to say what you want, what you feel from any perspective in five, four, three, two, one. So I think for me, the the shout out would need to go to the people that have helped me get where I am, because we're talking about leadership here. And I have had mentors over the years. Uh, my my last manager at Mozilla, Lawrence Mandel, was a huge influence for me. I will also say my third grade teacher, Mrs. Fredericks, uh, was probably the person who kept me from being in jail. So, you know, there there have been certain critical people in my life who have changed the path of my life or changed the path of my career and have pushed me to do more, who have pushed me to be better, who have shown me that I'm way harder on myself than anyone else is ever going to be and that I need to 
sit back and actually take a compliment and acknowledge that there's great stuff that I do too. Um, and obviously, you know, my, my partners, uh, Kieran and Doug, who are always supportive of me, uh, and my family, they always get a shout out too. So thank you very much. And we want to shout you out for, uh, coming on the podcast, uh, giving, uh, a true, true vision. I think everyone can take from this podcast, a good vision of leadership or see themselves in it or see themselves in this podcast in some form or another. Thanks very much. It was great to talk with you folks. You are the bomb.com in my book. Look forward (laughs) to chatting with you and engaging with you soon. Awesome. This has been a pleasure. (laughs) Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Women in Linux podcast. Women in Linux is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization created to get women involved in the field of IT using Linux as a foundation. You can connect with Women in Linux through social media at Women in Linux on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. To join weekly meetups, go to meetups.com forward slash Women in Linux. For more information and to connect with Women in Linux, go to www.womeninlinux.com. 